first, thank you, Playa, and thank you, everybody, for being here. And thank you, Playa, for putting all of this together and all the work that you and your committee, like Reset, is putting on it. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, I also want to thank the Sisterhood for handling the book sales. So, uh, <clears throat> I am sure that you know today is actually Purim, uh, the Jewish holiday that, uh, according to the Talmud, it says, Rashut Pekayam Hishtapesh and Etim Krobot, that on a regular basis we are supposed to act foolish. Uh, I also know, yes, hope, keep that in mind. Okay. Um, you know, like when two people are standing around, one person does something very silly, and the second person says, you know, applause, and the third person says, wait, don't, don't, don't encourage him. Well, having been encouraged by my rendition of the gambler from the installation, and I can't resist this because it's pouring. And you know what's coming if you stop and think about it. Dear sir or madam, will you read my book? It took me years to write. Won't you take a look? It's based on the Torah and the prophets, too. I wrote the book to help you stay a Jew. Paperback writer. Paperback rabbi. Right. Okay. First, I want to introduce you to my book, why I decided to write it. And I think this is vital to understand before you read the book. What I'm about to say to you is in the preface, if you are kind enough to buy the book to read, please read the preface. I know a lot of people who will actually skip the preface for books that they buy and read and just go straight to the chapters. Please don't do that with my book. Uh, you really need to read the preface uh, to understand it. And part of this is a book review. In a book review, we quote directly from our chapters. And so I want to read to you the following because I think it helps state numerous reasons why I did this. I saw her get out of her car with her Bible after she drove behind me into the parking lot of the bookstore. I had seen in my rearview mirror that she stared with a look of disdain and fascination at my Jewish bumper stickers and the appears like chrome but made of plastic Star of David. I held the door open for her after waiting for her to catch up to me. She thanked me and then hesitating as she walked in, asked me if she could talk to me. Great, I thought, here we go again. But I said to her, sure, is everything okay? Of course, but I saw your bumper stickers. I have some questions about Judaism. Are you Jewish? I said, yes, I'm a Jew. Would you like to sit down and talk? We found some chairs and sat down. Her face showed a mix of emotions. She looked excited, even as she looked a little scared, unsure and confused, as if in a new area of town where she knew where she wanted to go, but didn't know the way to get there. What's on your mind, I asked to help her begin. She replied, well, I've been reading my Bible and speaking to some friends of mine who are Jewish people, and I have been reading a few books by Jewish rabbis, so I had some questions. Okay, I told her. By the way, it's okay to call us Jews rather than Jewish people. After all, you don't say a Christian person, you just say a Christian. So, it's, so just say a Jew or Jews because that's what we are. Really, she said, because I thought it was kind of, you know, insulting to be a Jew. It's only insulting to those who think there is something wrong with being a Jew, I said. Before she could protest that she didn't think there was anything wrong with being a Jew because her best friends were Jews, I asked her, what's your first question? It didn't work, because she smiled and quickly said, I want you to know that I love the Jews, and I pray for the state of Israel every day. Then her questions just spilled out. But I don't understand why you're not all Messianic Jews. If the only thing that separates us is Jesus, we say he was the Messiah and you don't, what is stopping you from accepting him? I've heard Jewish rabbis calling Jesus a rabbi, and everyone speaks of the Judeo-Christian tradition. So if the first Christians were Jews and Judaism just led right into Christianity, why are so many Jewish people thousands of years later still not accepting him? In response, I said, well, I'm glad that you love the Jews and support Israel. However, I'd be happier if you love the Judaism that makes me a Jew and support my choice of Judaism that keeps me a Jew. At that, her smile disappeared, and over the course of our conversation, it, took, it became more and more of a frown. Hmm. <laughs> and that is, in a very small nutshell, why I chose to write the book. There's an enormous amount of misinformation there about Judaism, of course, but there is also <coughs> almost like a, a, a movement in the United States today that tries to make Judaism and Christianity look the same. And I think that's for a number of reasons. Uh, if you take a look, and we were sort of talking about this before we began, if you take a look at the secular community, which unfortunately outnumbers the religious community, 
It is easier for them to stay secular if they condemn not just one religion, but all religions, and it becomes easier to condemn if they paint us with a broad brush as all alike. They will say things like, she said at that uh, bookstore, uh, that the only thing that distinguishes between Judaism and Christianity is one believes in Jesus and the other doesn't, and there is so much more than that that distinguishes the two faiths. Uh, okay. More and more people believe that, only different, that the only difference between Judaism and Christianity is that the latter faith accepts Jesus as the Messiah while the former does not. They do not know why Jews have continued to reject Jesus as the Messiah, as Savior, and as the Son of God. They do not know that from Judaism's perspective, this Christian theological foundation that one must believe to be, in fact, a Christian is unbiblical and diametrically opposed to what the Bible states. So my book goes into those differences and tries to counteract the idea that Judaism and Christianity are the same except one believes in Jesus and the other doesn't. Okay. Uh, now, there are a number of elements that go in to trying to make Judaism and Christianity all look alike. And in some ways, we Jews are our own worst enemies. For example, unfortunately, I have heard too often Jews saying cutesy little things like, there are many rooms in the mansion of God. <laughs> or, there is only one God, but there are just different paths to get to God. Unfortunately, Jews will say this. Uh, and the idea of it is that we're all the same. If Judaism is only as good as, in this case, Christianity, if Judaism is only as good as other faiths, then why have we spent 4,000 years almost being persecuted and staying different if we are only as good as, if our religion is only as true as, if our religion is not better than, closer to biblical truth than other faiths, if it's only as good as or equal to, then let's just give up our differences and become like everybody else. We have to believe that our faith is in some way or another better than everybody else's, not just different, in order for us to have some reason to maintain it. If a person says, I am a Jew, it is no different than saying, I am not something else. Because I can always choose to be something else. By saying I am a Jew means I am choosing Judaism over everything else. My book tells you why. Now, there are people out there, and maybe in the room, who do not hold the Bible to be authoritative in any way, shape, or form, and who will in fact believe that the Bible is completely man-made and is not in any way, shape, or form affected, inspired, written by, influenced by, touched by something with God. And if that's the case, you're going to think my book to be foolish. Because if the basis of our faith being the Bible, the Torah, the Prophets, and the Writings, doesn't have some sort of divine authority, some connection to God in it, then everything I say about Judaism based on this Bible is, is basically going to be nothing but foolish. But if you ascribe any kind of authority to the biblical text, by the way, remember something. In my book and here today, every time I use the word Bible, it's only referring to the Hebrew Scriptures. The New Testament is the Christian appendix added onto the Bible by Christianity and not part of the Bible. In the 300s BCE, so 300 years before Jesus was born, the Jews of Greece, the Hellenized Jews, were calling the Bible Tabiblia, which means the book, which is what became the source for the term the Bible. So we were calling it the Bible long before Christianity was on the scene. If you don't believe the Bible has some authority in your life, then the whole book and everything we're discussing is, is foolishness. But if you believe the Bible is authoritative in any way, shape, or form, 
My argument is you cannot believe in Christianity because it is unbiblical at its base, and what it says contradicts what the Bible states. Okay. Uh, another way in which Jews have been our own worst enemy is a direct result of our being so small a minority. When I have spoken anywhere, college campuses, when I've had church groups come here, I will ask the question, what percentage of the United States population are Jews? Less than 1%. How, how many? It's less than 1%. Less than 1%. 5%. Percent. How much? 3%. Three. Three. Three Three. You're knowledgeable. The answer is 2%. Every single survey is between 1.8 and 2.2, so figure 2%. You ask them when they come, they'll say, oh, 25%, 30%. It's an overestimation of the size of our population. But we are such a tiny minority that, let's see, we, we are such a tiny minority that to be outwardly, openly, proudly Jewish is a problem. And when we are not openly, outwardly, proudly Jewish, it becomes easy to make it look like Judaism and Christianity are all the same. Or that Judaism and Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism are all the same. Different paths to the same God. Okay. Uh, Jews have a tendency to be Jewish Uncle Toms. What do I mean by that? Not, of course, that anybody in my congregation would even think about doing this, of course, but it's like being at a uh, restaurant and with your fellow Jews and talking about anything and everything, and all of a sudden the topic becomes something that's Jewish. All of a sudden you're talking like this. Okay? The conversation drops. Uh, you may have seen, and I mentioned it in my book, and I mentioned it... Uh, about with the lady following me into the uh, bookstore, the back of my car with three bumper stickers on it, choose to be chosen, choose Judaism, an invitation to anybody who sees it to convert to Judaism, uh, whatjewsbelieve.org, creenciehudia.org, uh, the Spanish translation, and a looks like chrome but made out of plastic Star of David, okay? And I've parked my car at the parking lot of Houston Baptist University and never had so much as a pamphlet put on my car. But Jews will say, ooh, aren't you afraid of that, get being shot by a Christian? No joke. So we Jews don't, are not outwardly, openly, proudly who we are. We tend to quiet it down. Quick example, because I'm really running out of time. Uh, confirmation class, we have three packets of material we go through in the first semester and every time we finish a packet we go out to lunch or breakfast as a group and this is part of the method to my madness because right before we eat after we've been served in a somewhat loud voice I will say Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz and the reaction of the kids tells me a lot about their family life. Some of them will sit up straight and, you know, and some of them will crouch down, don't want to be seen. Okay? It's hard to be a member of a minority. Uh, okay. All these things go into the idea that Judaism and Christianity are the same. Uh, okay. So what are some of the, th oh, forgot. I want to make sure that everybody knows certain things that are in my acknowledgments. Okay? First, I want you to know, thank you to the members of Congregation Sha'ar HaShalom, Houston, Texas, for all of your love and support. <clears throat> Especially to the 10th grade confirmation classes over the years in which we would discuss the issues raised in this book. <coughs> I also have, because I saw him walk in somewhere, thank you Ron Zaguli for taking the photograph of the incredibly handsome man on the back of this book. <laughs> okay, that's not exactly what it says, but it's close. All right. But, since Quintel is back in Houston, uh, thank you to all those who helped in the creation, maintenance, and improvements of the website. Yeah. Choosebelief.org. 
Surely the precursor to this book would tell a Bart named Shinerman, Ed Shinerman, Jonas Shinerman, as well as Wendy Morrison for the most recent update. And thank you, Jonas Mylander, uh, not here today, uh, for turning the website into a smartphone app. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Monotheism and Trinity. Now I'm going to give you pieces of a few of the chapters to give you a, a, a uh, tease so you'll want to buy the book or you'll want to burn it. <laughs> there are various manifestations of God in the Bible, however, this does not mean that each is to be regarded as an entity separate from and unequal to the others, but they are somehow one and the same. Jews believe that each manifestation of God is only how God chose to be experienced by human beings. We worship God and not the manifestations of God. We do not feel we have to go through one manifestation of God to commune with a different manifestation of God. When we pray, we pray simply to God, directly to God. Uh, let's see... Uh, God is not a man. It seems to be a hallmark of the ancient Hellenistic Phrygian, which is a northeast section of uh, the Mediterranean, uh, characteristic of those gods and goddesses that they're uh, half human and half God. If I say to you, uh, his mother was human, his father was God, it sounds like Hercules. 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 Or... Uh, pro, did you say Prometheus? Uh, it was certainly uh, uh, Hercules, Dionysus, uh, Krishna, Mithra, um, and Jesus. Okay. Uh, by the way, we just had one. We're about to have another. There are three Jewish holy days that celebrate the very idea that God is God, humans are humans, God does not become a human, and humans don't become God. For example, Passover. Passover is a celebration of the exodus of the Jews from slavery in Egypt. God brought the Jews out of slavery by performing miracles which came in the form of plagues. These plagues were not just against Pharaoh and the Egyptians, as most people think, but against the gods of the Egyptians as well. Exodus 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. For example, Egyptians worshipped the Nile, but Moses on behalf of God struck the Nile and made it bleed. Uh, they wore, the Egyptians worshipped the sun, Ra, but one of God's plagues was darkness for three days. The plague of locusts and hail that destroyed the crops were against the Egyptian gods of the harvest. And finally, the last plague was against the firstborn sons who became the priests of these Egyptian gods. And because Pharaoh, a human, was held to be God, sound familiar, uh, by the Egyptians, the text of Exodus 11.5 tells us that the plague of the death of the firstborn went all the way up to the throne of Pharaoh. And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, for the firstborn of Pharaoh that sits upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. The holiday of Passover has a way of saying, Sorry, Pharaoh, you're not God. Hanukkah. Antiochus of Syria wanted to unify his, pe his empire by making all of its inhabitants into Hellenists, followers of Zeus. But the Jews refused, of course, because they believed and still believe in only one God. Antiochus saw this as insurrection, began persecuting the Jews, but Antiochus called himself Antiochus Epiphanes, which means Antiochus, who is God made manifest. The Jews eventually rebelled, giving us Hanukkah, and the holiday of Hanukkah has a way of saying, Sorry, Antiochus, you're not God. Purim, which we just celebrated, is the holiday that celebrates the events of the biblical book of Esther. Okay, the holiday of Purim. Okay, uh, in this story, there is a character named Haman. <laughs> hated the Jews because the Jewish, Jewish hero Mordechai would not bow down to him. The holiday of Purim has a way of saying, sorry Haman, <laughs> you're not God. So major distinctions between the uh, faiths. Okay? Uh, Satan versus the devil. How Christianity uses the term Satan and devil almost interchangeably. The Hebrew Scriptures talks about the Satan, not a Satan, but the Satan, and that's how it's found in the Hebrew who works for God, not against God, to find out what the truth is by doing sting operations like a district attorney. Okay? Did not put it in the book. Maybe should have. Anybody know the uh, movie um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Yeah. Anybody heard of Slugworth? Yes. At the end of the, at the beginning of the movie, Slugworth is trying to steal stuff from... All right, but at the end you find out he works for... Willy Wonka, okay, perfect example of who the devil is. I'm sorry, who the Satan is in Judaism. 
You know, does sting operations tries to get people to disobey God's laws, but actually works for God to find out what the... Okay, fine. All right, and I show... all Everything I'm doing, I show with biblical verses, okay? Uh, nature of humanity. Uh, Christian view of the fall of Adam and Eve because they sinned in the Garden of Eden. The word sin doesn't even exist in the passage about uh, Adam and Eve. Its first use is for Cain's jealousy of Abel. If I don't know the difference between good and evil, how can I know that it's a sin to disobey God when God tells me don't eat the tree of the knowledge of the difference between good and evil? So you can't say that they sinned. Uh, there are two trees in the Garden of Eden they're not supposed to eat from. One is called the Tree of Life. And the biblical text explicitly says that God separated Adam and Eve, kicked them out of the Garden of Eden to separate them from the Tree of Life so they would not become immortal, which makes mortality their natural state. They did not bring death into the world. We don't die because they sinned. Death is a natural order of creation. Uh, let's see. One of the, the biggest chapter in my book is on Jewish law because of Paul's writings in the New Testament. It is the most misunderstood by Christianity in general, and certainly by Paul specifically, how Jewish law works. You are driving a car, you come to a school zone, you slow your car down to how many miles per hour? You go into the school zone and you see that you are going 23. Are you breaking the law? Therefore, you have to pull the car aside and never drive again because having broken the law, you're now outside the law and God condemns you and gives you the death penalty because to break even one law is to break all the laws and so all the penalties of one law are the same, right? Okay. Right. Uh, I just quoted uh, Galatians, Hebrews, and Corinthians from the Christian New Testament who looks at Jewish law and the only law that would have existed at the time Paul was writing is called the Bible. So he's actually saying that biblical law comes as a curse to show you you can't obey the law perfectly and therefore God will condemn you unless you accept Jesus. So the, um, you come to a school zone, you go 23 miles an hour, uh, you are breaking the law and therefore you should go 90. Right? You're breaking the law anyway, go 90, right? Well, gee, Rabbi, uh, when I go into McDonald's for uh, my breakfast... I may as well get the bacon because, you know, the, I may, for lunch, I may as well get the bacon cheeseburger because the hamburger's not meat, and not kosher anyway, and I'm mixing milk and meat, so I may as well get the pig. My argument, which comes from a Hasidic story, is that it's better to go into McDonald's and get the cheeseburger than the bacon cheeseburger, because as soon as you say, I'm not eating bacon because it's against God's laws, you are automatically in relationship with God. It's better to get the hamburger than it is the cheeseburger because now you're taking it to a higher level. Okay? It's better to get the fish sandwich than the hamburger. It's better to get the salad than the fish. But to say, well, I'm breaking the law anyway. I may as well go 90 in the school zone is saying, well, it's not kosher anyway. I may as well get the bacon cheeseburger. As soon as you say, I'm obeying God's laws, even if your standard of Judaism is low, you still are acknowledging that you have a 613 rung ladder that will climb, that you will climb and elevate you and bring you closer to the divine and to spiritualize your life. In a nutshell, that's what the chapter on Jewish law is. How much time have I gone over? 23 minutes. Okay. Well, three minutes. That's not so bad. Okay. Uh, <laughs> By the way, yes. Yeah, go ninety. Okay, make twenty more minutes. Okay. All right. One person dying for the sins of another. Okay. Deuteronomy twenty four sixteen. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. If every man is put to death for his own sin, Jesus can't die for your sin. Remember, every one of these things are basic elemental beliefs of Christianity that society out there will say, oh, it's all alike. Jews and Christians believe the same thing. But there's a theology that is the under, that, that girds up the belief in Jesus as the Messiah, Savior, and Son of God that that foundation Judaism finds to be unbiblical. Like the idea that Jesus can die for your sin. And aside, not in my book, 
gee, for some reason it just doesn't happen anymore, but I used to get Christian missionaries coming to my door. And I would invite them in, and I would say, you know, I've had questions. God must have sent you to me, and I'm glad you're here. Invite them in, ask them if they like water, Coca-Cola, unless they're Mormon. Uh, and I would say, come on in, I have some questions. But usually they have a memorized speech that they must give. You know, when you have a yo-yo, and you let it go, it slowly comes down to the end of its, okay. So it's what I call letting their yo-yo run out. <laughs> so I let them do their speech, their yo-yo run out, they give their speech, and I, find, I say, fine, I have a question, my first question, can I borrow your, your Bible, not mine, theirs, I thumb to Deuteronomy 24.16, so I have the page, like I have this, and I say, tell me something, what did Jesus do for you? They have to say, he died for my sins, excuse me, would you read Deuteronomy chapter 24.16? Out loud, the father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Look at the time, I've got to go. <laughs> and they're out the door. And there are numerous verses of the Hebrew scriptures that indicate why Jesus cannot die for your sin. Let's see. Uh, okay. The necessity of a blood sacrifice. Uh, Hebrews 9.22 And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. Without a blood sacrifice you can't be forgiven for sin. Uh, what do we read on Yom Kippur afternoon? The very day we're talking about forgiveness, Jonah. sin, Jonah. Jonah. And what exactly does it say in Jonah? The Jonah goes to the people of Nineveh, whom he hates, really doesn't want to see them repent because in the book of Jonah, he's the biggest creep. He's the only creep in the whole book. Uh, the people on the boat, before they pitch him over and he gets swallowed by the great fish, they're doing everything they can to save him. The biggest creep in the book is Jonah himself. He finally goes to Nineveh, says five words of the original Hebrew, another 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's all he says. Doesn't even do it in the middle of the city. And what is their response? Sackcloth and ashes. Sackcloth and ashes. Fasting. Fasting. Okay. Cry mightily to God. Prayer. Okay. And when God saw their works, not their faith, their works, when God saw their works, their deeds, what they actually did, that they stopped doing the evil, God forgave them. Where in that passage does it say anything about a blood sacrifice? And yet God forgives. Which means... If I can show you even one place in the Bible where God forgives somebody, somewhere, in this case a whole people, a whole town, without a blood sacrifice, then you don't have to have a blood sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. Uh, let's see. If Christians say you have to have a blood sacrifice for sin, then somebody had to die on the cross. Somebody had to do the dying. Well, they'll say Jesus did the die. So the question becomes, was it Jesus the God who died? Sorry, my God can't die. It had to be Jesus the human part that did the dying, which means the basis of Christianity is called human sacrifice. And what does God say about human sacrifice? Deuteronomy, chapter 12, verse 31. Deuteronomy is, you're going into the promised land, you're going to be rubbing elbows with pagans. Don't become like them. Don't act like they do. Don't look at how they worship their gods and start worshiping me the same way. God is saying to the Jews, you're Jewish. They can have what they have, you can't. Deuteronomy 12, 30-31. Take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them, after that they be destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Thou shalt not do so unto the eternal thy God, for every abomination to the eternal which he hates have they done to their gods, for even their sons and their daughters have they burned in the fire to their gods. God calls human sacrifice an abomination and something he hates. In Jeremiah he says it's something so horrible he would never, he wouldn't even think to ask people to do it. Oh, wait, sorry, God changes his mind. After telling you don't become like the pagans who believe in human sacrifice, now you're supposed to turn around, start believing in human sacrifice, and not only that, 
It's God's human son that you're supposed to believe in. And when did God assemble all millions of Jews at one place like at Sinai to give us this new law and change his mind? Didn't happen. Okay. And I have a huge article, uh, essay, whatever, chapter on the Messiah itself. The way the Christians define the term Messiah and the way the Jews de de uh, define the term Messiah are two totally, radically different concepts. We use the same word, but they have totally different meanings between the two faiths. So when these people who try to, all religions are the like, Judaism and Christianity is the same, except one doesn't believe in the Messiah and the other does, how we understand the word Messiah is totally different from each other. Christianity, Messiah, Jesus, is God became flesh and died for the sins of the people. I already showed that nobody else can die for your sins. Okay? And our concept of a Messiah is a human being born of two human parents, just like the normal way people come into existence, who can trace his lineage back through his human father, through King Solomon, back to King David, without going through Jehoiakim, Jeconiah, or Shealtiel. And I show all of this in biblical sh uh, verses from the Hebrew Scriptures. Okay? New Testament, Matthew and Luke are the only places that have a uh, lineage for Jesus. They don't agree with each other except in three places. The first place they agree uh, with is that Joseph wasn't the biological father of Jesus. So who cares what the genealogy is? Because if Jesus can't trace his lineage through his human father, who cares what his lineage is? The Bible explicitly says you can't be adopted into King David's line. You have to be from his body. All these wishes, verses are in here. So if Joseph, you're all old enough, if Joseph didn't have sex with Mary to make Jesus, then who cares what Joseph's lineage is? You can't inherit anything through your mother. Trick question. Think about your answer before you give the answer. In Judaism, how do we trace lineage? Through the Father. Jewishness, which is citizenship rights, is through the mother. Because you always know who the mother is. Okay? Lineage, inheritance rights, is through the Father. Numbers chapter 1, verse 2, when they did the census, through the fathers. Every single genealogy, including the New Testament, is so-and-so the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, or so-and-so, the father of so-and-so, the father of so-and-so. If there are women mentioned, they're only because they're famous women, but the lineage still goes through their husband. So the father of Jesus was God, not Joseph, so who cares about his lineage anyway? But even if it was acceptable to be a lineage, the lineage of Matthew and the lineage of, Je of Luke only come together in two other places, Remember I said you had to be a descendant of King Solomon back to King David? Luke's genealogy goes through Solomon's brother. Who's the next king of England? Charles. If Charles abdicates the throne, does Andrew, his brother, get it? So therefore, a person who's the brother of the person who becomes king loses out. So according to Luke... The lineage of Joseph goes through uh, Nathan, the brother of Solomon, instead of Solomon. The other time they come together is with Shealtiel, who is a grandson of a king who was so bad that God says none of his descendants can sit on the throne of King David and rule over Judah again. Well, if the, both Matthew and Luke say that Jesus is a descendant of Shealtiel, through Joseph, but that's another issue. If they say he's a descendant of, of Shealtiel, who's a descendant of, of Jehoiakim, and Jehoiakim's descendants can't sit on the throne of King David, then the lineage of Jesus proves that Jesus can't be the Messiah. So, oh, and what is the Messiah supposed to do if not die for your sins from a Jewish perspective? Utopia. And I give over 20 different verses of the Bible describing what the Messianic days are supposed to look like. Christianity invents the idea of a second coming to excuse why Jesus didn't do what the real Messiah will do the first time he comes around. 
so quickly. You are sitting in your house at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and all of a sudden, half your lights go out. You go over to the light switches, nothing changes. You go outside to the uh, breaker box, everything's fine. So you come back in, get on your computer, and do a Google search for an electrician. Half an hour later, you get the knock on the door, you open it up, and breezing past you, the man says, hi, I'm the electrician, and he's filled his arms with pipes and wrenches. And he goes up to your kitchen sink, but there's nothing wrong with it. He goes to your toilets, pardon the expression, and there's nothing wrong with it, and he leaves. Ten minutes after that, there's another knock on the door, and your next door neighbor says, hey, I just saw Bill the electrician, isn't he fantastic? And you say, what, what are you talking about? The, he, he, he's not an electrician. Electricians fix electrical devices. That's what the term means. That's where it comes from. No, 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 no. You got the wrong definition of the word electrician. Electricians fixes plumbing. So the argument ensues for, let's say, about 2013 years. And over time, your next door neighbor says, look, Bill the electrician was a fabulous electrician. Someday he's going to come back and he will do all the things that he was supposed to do with your house to fix it. But until then, he was a great electrician. You're just too blind to be able to see it. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> this is what they tell us. After Jesus came and went, nothing in the world had changed. Especially all those things that the real Messiah will change when he comes. No difference. Okay. Now we're coming to the real uh, end, so I'm going to stop after one more thing. One of the groups that has the best advantage in saying that there's no real difference between Jews and Christians are the Christian missionaries who are trying to make us Christian. Because if we're all the same anyway, there is no real difference. There is no meaning to be a Jew. Let's just all become Christian if there's no real difference. So the Christian missionaries will do their best to make it look like Judaism and Christianity are the same. My book, at the end, first takes the ten most commonly used biblical verses that Christians say point to Jesus, and I show why they're wrong. And I use a very simplest way. There may be ten different ways to show how their interpretation of our Hebrew scriptures is, in, un, is unbiblical. But what I use is the simple and easiest way that allows us to maintain the theology of the Hebrew scriptures and still explain why their understanding of our Hebrew scriptures is wrong. Also, in my text, I also define what is a Jew. When God spoke to Abraham, God said to Abraham, I will make you a great culture. Right? When God spoke to Abraham, God said, I will make you a great ethnic group. Right? We're not an ethnic group. We are not a culture. We are a nation. What is the process called for a person to become a U.S. citizen, a citizen of our U.S. nation? Naturalization. What's the process called for someone who wants to become a member of a Jewish nation? Not the state of Israel, okay, but the people. Conversion to Judaism. So if a person converts to Judaism to become a Jew, a person born a Jew who converts to another religion is no longer a Jew. And I give example after example after example after example and all sorts of references to Jewish law because it's not ex-Jews who are now Christians or Christians who are Jewish wannabes who define for Jews who is a Jew. Okay? All right. Now, I've really overextended my 20 minutes, I'm sure. But any quick questions before we, I do some signing, I hope?